Weekend action sees Olympic records shattered. IOC's president speaks out against gender disputes, and Ice Cube calls out USA basketball on the world stage. It's Monday, August 5th. I'm your guest host, John Shames, and this is Front Office Sports Today. First, some Olympic results from this weekend. Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz battled it out in the gold medal tennis match on Sunday morning, with Djokovic securing the first Olympic gold medal of his career. Katie Ledecky becomes the most gold medaled female Olympian ever on Saturday by winning the 800 meter freestyle for her ninth gold. Also, the US swimming medley sets a world record in the four person 100 meter relay, defeating a surging China squad in the process. Simone Biles won her third gold of 2024 on Saturday, this time in the pole vault. It's her 10th Olympic medal ever and her seventh gold. And Shakari Richardson was upset in the 100 meter by St. Lucia's Julian Alfred on Saturday, as the Caribbean nation won its first Olympic medal ever, gold or otherwise. The NFLPA told the league and fanatics not to sell Marvin Harrison Jr. jerseys, the latest development in a months-long and still ongoing dispute with the apparel company. When Harrison signed his rookie contract with the Arizona Cardinals in May, Ian Rappaport reported that the NFLPA had acquired MHJ's jersey rights in the process. Now, the Players Association is telling the Cardinals, the NFL, and Fanatics that they are still not permitted to sell the jersey. It's unclear whether this will be resolved prior to the season. Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympics Committee, has condemned the hate speech towards Olympic boxers Lin Yu Ting and Imani Khalif. Neither woman was allowed to fight in last year's World Boxing Championship for failing to meet gender eligibility criteria. Bach has since defended the IOC's decision to allow Yu Ting and Khalif to fight. The NBA is planning to grow its presence in Europe, and that could come in the form of a new European basketball league. Commissioner Adam Silver told the Associated Press that the NBA is weighing whether to start its own annual tournament or league on the continent across the pond. Silver said that while he, quote, certainly hasn't made any definitive decisions, I continue to believe that there is enormous opportunity here. Matthew Bowyer, the bookie at the center of the gambling scandal surrounding Shohei Otani's former interpreter, Ipe Muzuhara, has pleaded guilty to three federal charges related to his illegal sports betting operation. Bowyer's operation reportedly led to over $4 million in unregulated income in 2022, and the bookmaker could now face up to two decades in prison for his actions. Team USA's three-on-three basketball team is struggling, both men's and women's teams. Rap legend and the Big Three founder Ice Cube thinks his league can field a more competitive team than Team USA organizers have, and he made that known in a Friday conversation with FOS reporter Colin Salau. With more than $100,000 on the line, Ice Cube challenges the eventual gold medal winners, whoever it may be, to take on the Big Three roster of their choice. Today we have legendary rapper, but also the owner and founder of the Big Three, Ice Cube, to talk about three-on-three basketball and what's going on in the Olympics. But before anything, Ice Cube, I want to ask you, uh, you know, you're on tour right now. You have all this going on. How are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm great. You know, it's, uh, I'm right where I want to be. Uh, we got a show tonight in uh, Oklahoma City, a uh, show tomorrow night in, um, in San Antonio. So we having fun. You having fun and all of this is going on right now. So obviously we're here to talk about uh, the big three, as well as, you know, kind of in the involvement with what's going on with the men's uh, USA 3x3 basketball team. I'll, I'll ask you first straight up, what's been your reaction to kind of watching this team and their performance in the Olympics? Well, I want to just start off by congratulating them because they did win the game today, uh, from what I understand. But, um, you know, I just know from my vantage point, um, those are some good players but they're not the best that we have to offer in three on three. And so, um, you know, to me, when you go to the Olympics, you want to put your best foot forward and we're not. So to me, that's an issue because they have dropped three or four games 
before winning one. And um, I think it's unacceptable to most, you know, people here uh, in the U.S. us losing basketball games when we don't have to. Exactly. Um, so you were just on the Pat McAfee show. You, you know, given that you've just seen um, what's been going on with the USA basketball team losing those games to start off, um, you issued a challenge to the winner, the gold medal winner. Can you tell me those details? Yeah, we, we think, you know, it's only right if the gold medal winners uh, come and play the big three all-stars uh, and see who's the best in the world. Uh, Pat McAfee put up a hundred thousand um, dollars. You know we're gonna put some money on top of that, fly him in, and uh, put him up. And you know we could do this August eighteenth, right before our championship game. It's on CBS; the whole world can watch. And um, I think it's fun. It's friendly. It's a friendly competition. You know they have friendlies in soccer all the time so this is our version of a friendly you know we we want to call it the big cup though because we feel like uh it's a big deal you think that um if you know there's i, I don't think it's it's out of the question yet for usa basketball to somehow get that gold is is that offer there too if it's usa basketball that does somehow get it any any team that wins the gold we believe we got the best three on three players in the world and we don't think it's close. Um, of course, if you have the best USA basketball players in the world, um, I want to ask from there, you know, what's, why aren't the players in big three being considered uh, to be the ones participating for USA basketball in the Olympics? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of politics involved when it comes to USA basketball. Uh, you know, we saw what went down with Jalen Brown. And I think that, you know, reverberates a little bit when it comes to uh, the big three. And, you know, the same people who, who run the NBA have a lot of, uh, a lot of power and say so when it comes to USA basketball. And so I think these people uh, have a personal uh, reason to not, you know, grab our players. And this has nothing to do with winning a gold medal. And I think it should be all about winning a gold medal and personal grudges and personal um, things should be set aside when it comes to, to the Olympics. So, you know, speaking on those personal grudges and those other things that you want to set aside, would you have you had conversations with USA Basketball? And also, are you open to conversations with USA Basketball? Yeah, we've talked to USA Basketball uh, before the 2020 Olympics when uh, when the USA didn't even qualify to play. So uh, we were talking to them before that saying, um, you know, you guys should consider using our players. And they were talking this point stuff, and they have to have so many points and FIBA and blah, 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 blah. But they don't, they don't, they don't make the NBA players do the points, you know, so why should they make our professional players do the points? Um, we're not amateurs. Um, in the big three. So at the end of the day, it's just, it don't make crazy man sense, as my friend would say, uh, while we're not winning and dominating. You know, our, our worst team would dominate um, whoever wins this gold medal. You know, speaking of those requirements, obviously, like you said, they're not going to be paid or in, in the same way. And these are professionals. Um, but have you spoken to any players or, or coaches? You, you have some legendary, you know, coaches, some former, you know, longtime all stars in the NBA. Have you spoken to them about what their thoughts are about potentially, you know, making that team down the line? 
they want to go. They want to represent. We have, you know, several great players that would love to uh, to represent the U.S. and um, win a medal, gold medal, and you know, um, you know, make their family and country proud. Yeah, we, are, you know, probably every last one of them would want to do it. Yeah. Um, just one final thing. You know, there there are people who are going to say, hey, you know, you're not, you, you guys play a different sport. Uh, it's like kind of a different format um, or other naysayers who are going to, you know, say other things uh, to that to that extent. You know, maybe, you know, the team's still not going to be as good, all of that. What would you kind of say to any of the doubters um, for, for claims that you guys would win the gold on, on any team? We'll play any style, whatever y'all want to do. And I guarantee you we'll win. Uh, let's 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 stop the talk and do it on the court. You know we got a challenge out there. Um, once we see who wins the gold medal, we'll be more specific in our challenge, and we'll see if they accept it. You know, it's, it's just basketball. Like, what do we have to lose? It's been interesting to be able to see the big three grow as well. Uh, and then with this 3x3 basketball. So we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and, and iron out these details. And we look forward to seeing, you know, when those details are more ironed out and hearing that from you guys. Um, so appreciate you coming on. Anytime, man. Thanks. Any sports bettors using DraftKings in Pennsylvania, Illinois, Vermont, or New York will have to cough up a little bit of extra coin to gamble at the start of the new year. DraftKings has announced that they will be adding a winning surcharge to net winnings for users in those four states as of January 1st, 2025. The new tax has not been well received thus far as the betting company's stock slid more than 10% in trading on Friday morning. DraftKings has had its first ever profitable quarter since going public in April of 2020, and this new surcharge is coming as a way to further boost profits in states that heavily tax the sports betting industry. U.S. District Judge Philip Gutierrez, who made headlines last week for overturning the $4.7 billion verdict against the NFL in the Sunday ticket lawsuit, is retiring as soon as October of this year. In a letter to President Joe Biden, Gutierrez wrote, On October 15, 2024, I intend to retire from regular active service. The NFL got its big break last week when Gutierrez dramatically tossed aside the jury's verdict. The judge ultimately ruled that the group did not follow his instructions for calculating damages. Given its antitrust nature, this case could have cost the NFL over $14 billion if the adjudication had held. That's more than the league makes each year from broadcasting revenue. FS1 executives believe Nick Wright is the future of the network after Skip Bayless's departure. Skip Bayless has announced he's leaving FS1 after eight years with the company, and now the sports network is debating blowing up most of its weekday studio show lineup. FS1 is even considering canceling Undisputed altogether. One thing is for certain though, Nick Wright is the face of the network after Skip's departure, and many look towards Wright as the future of FS1. FOS reporter Mike McCarthy learned that Fox is also considering building a program around Chicago-based radio personality Danny Parkins, who's recently guest-hosted with Colin Coward and is good friends with Wright. The pressure is on for FS1 to get this next run of programming correct after letting Shannon Sharp leave last year in favor of the controversial Skip Bayless. Before his vacation, Owen had the chance to sit down with IMG Media President Adam Kelly to discuss the rapid evolution of media rights deals and how IMG continues to position itself ahead of that curve. That conversation is coming up next. Joined now by Adam Kelly, President of IMG's Media Business. Welcome, Adam. Hi, nice to be here. Great to have you on. So. I want to start with a, a pretty big general topic, but one that comes into my mind anytime we see things like the NBA is going to get $76 billion over 11 years for its media rights or any similar story, um, which is just how leagues and their media partners arrive at a number. Because if you had told me a year ago the NBA is going to get $60 billion or $90 billion or whatever, probably most numbers would sound right enough to me because I just don't really have a great gauge on on how these things you know get to 
to the actual number. So if you could sort of take us into the various, you know, factors and ingredients that go into yeah, how, how these deals are struck and how these, these yeah, leagues and their media partners arrive at the number. Sure. If you, if you really look at the, the space, how, how do you create value from sport for media partners and, and outlets? That's, that's really the, the very origin of, of how you start to assess value creation and the value that some of these, these deals really garner in, in the market. We, we've taken a very new, very strategic approach at, at IMG as, as we've really transitioned our business to become real deep experts in the space and to become much more strategic in our approach so that when it comes to assessing value, we, we've got a real answer that's not just based on, well, these rights are interesting and people love watching sport and you know you, you put them out in the market and just the natural competition will find the level. You know, there has to be more than that. And, and over the years, we've come to realize that a real granular assessment, understanding key data points, understanding the econometrics here is, is vital for our role, you know, essentially as an, as an agency in this space and the leading agency in the space to really giving clear advice and guidance as to what value should be generated, what should be created. And, and, and what we've done over the past few years is, is really build up a, a brand new function and, and capability set. And in doing so in housed a lot of the top level executives from various consulting and, and strategy groups to create what, what I think is a, as a market leading service and allowed us to develop our valuation model. What we're able to do then is, is to take a theoretical modeling and, and the economics as we understand them from the data perspective and combine that with IMG's unrivaled global network where we have a worldwide sales team in every territory who a day-to-day -day transacting and negotiating on behalf of rights holders across the full spectrum of, of the sports world, everyone from the likes of UEFA, FIFA in the in the football and soccer world, depending on on your um, on your origin, um, all the way through to the likes of the NBA, NFL, Wimbledon, the RNA, some key clients in the space, so that we can really prove the value both to our partners and to the potential buyers, which, as you know, have, have really transitioned over the years from traditional broadcasters all the way through to, to the world's leading streaming companies and, and technology businesses. But what we do is, is really look at the size of the addressable market for each property, understanding and being very accurate as to the relationship between the fans, the level of audience, as we have seen it historically, our forecast for development and growth, how those real economic valuations then work in context of the market in real time. You know, we have, we have a constant dialogue with broadcasters, rights holders, so that we can um, really kind of cross-examine and, and try to triangulate where, where the value points uh, are assessed. But it's, it's understanding the data of audiences. It's understanding in some cases where and how they drive returns from advertising revenues where they drive returns in some cases from subscription fees regular um, income as well as brand partnerships that can result off the back of of the the broadcast and distribution of these rights and really understanding therefore how within this environment how you can pinpoint current value whilst also understanding that there's in many cases now, uh, a scarcity value to acquiring, particularly when it comes to long-term acquisitions and long-term licenses of these rights, how they can impact a, a platform, a broadcaster, and ultimately a wider revenue generation pool that can be created off the back of some of these market-moving rights, as we've seen with, with the protracted NBA negotiations, that we, as we saw relatively recently with, with the NFL, and just how much they can they can move the market you know even as of this week you know sport continues to set record ratings and record audience levels um the euro finals in the uk broke a 15 year record where 24 million people were watching the game out of a population of 
58 to 60. That, that is incredible. And, and nothing else can do that outside of sport. So sport, you know, we talk about the evolution of media. We talk about the saturation of content. We talk about the future of AI and what that may mean, but nothing cuts through like sport. And so for those entities looking to the future, what, what rights will be valuable today, tomorrow, and long-term into the future. I mean, I'm bullish, I'm in the space, but sport delivers above all else. So understanding how to drive value, how to assess value is, is really important, but also appreciating, appreciating just how powerful this asset class is. Well, one thing I think you're maybe starting to get into there that I'm, I'm pretty curious about is um, to what degree, you know, eyeballs are, are worth the same amount of money and, and to what degree they're not like is, um, um, is, is a, a someone on streaming worth more than someone on cable because there's, there's one industry on the rise and, and one that's declining, uh, at the same time, you're probably going to get more ad dollars from that, you know, that, that viewer who's watching on cable. Um, so yeah, if I, if I know that, or if I can estimate that, you know, two leagues are each going to get a hundred million viewers over their seasons. Um, but, but that's all I know. I'm, I'm wondering like how much of a range there is in terms of how, how much those, you know, hypothetical hundred million viewers could be worth in terms of, you know, their, their demographics and how they're consuming the content. Well, and I'd, I'd go back to the, the, the core uh, understanding here, which is we're, we're in the attention economy. And, and that battle for, for attention is increasingly fierce. Platforms, operators, digital outlets are all fighting for the, the same share of, of screen time. And where sport delivers is in the power of the engagement. So can you compare one sport versus another? Can you, can you compare one platform versus another? It, it really comes down to the predictability of a, of a sports fan tuning in to live. Live is by, by far and away the biggest revenue generating medium. And therefore you have the predictability factor that that is incredibly powerful for means and, and efforts in converting that attention into value. And again, that comes back to the core of the attention economy comes back to the origins of advertising comes back to, you know, the, the real driver for media and entertainment. So from the basis that you can forecast with sports audiences, from the basis that you know you've got them highly engaged at various points through the transmission, from the fact that increasingly through digital, you can identify those audiences, not in general survey, you know, broad brush strokes, but you can actually identify that you can convert through calls to action specifically, you know, as the advertising platforms, don't forget, you know, the, the reach of Amazon's prime video is in, you know, the top range of, of 200 million approaching 300 million people globally. And, and they've been able to switch on their advertising platform effectively to all of those people. And lo and behold, they're the biggest retailer in the, in the world. You know, it's pretty clear that the conversion of audiences through Amazon's prime video service is going to be far more powerful than you're going to be able to convert through putting a, a blanket advert for, you know, brand of choice on CBS or an NBC, even if you've got the same number of people watching the Super Bowl or an NFL game. So, yeah, one fan is not like for like. You know, I'm very bullish about the, the impending success of sport on Netflix, whether that be the NFL games on Christmas Day or the launch of, of WWE come January. I think they're going to have incredible success on that platform. And there, Netflix will retain more subscribers, will have more engaged audiences, will acquire new fans, will have more, you know, second home subscriptions popping up. You know, I, I know their, their earnings are, are pending, but I'm bullish on Netflix. I'm incredibly bullish about the impact sport is going to have for them. And that will grow. We're seeing, you know, more engagement from, from Apple, with a successful launch of the MLS as one of their, their key entertainment acquisitions over the past few years. We're fortunate to be powering that service through the content production we do on behalf of MLS. And we've significantly enhanced 
the broadcast so the quality of the product looks far better on screen so back to your point you've got more engaged fans using apple services we know their service segment is one of their fastest growing and even more meaningful segments than it's ever been so you've got different companies leaning in in different ways and you know as jeff shell recently said you know linear tv is is far from over there's decades of value to be generated through linear tv even if as most people are certain there will be a an ongoing steady steady decline so various ways of generating returns from each of those platforms in very different ways but you know the power of attention the way that you can convert that into real value as an operator as a platform as a broadcaster as a digital service i mean I, i'm i think i'm hopefully making the point that there are multiple means of of conversion and and each of them are are in their own way very valuable is the amazon viewer the most valuable viewer you would say right now i know it's hard to truly rank these things but i don't think there's anything quite comparable to the ability to not you maybe you see a commercial or maybe there's just a banner ad because you you bought something on amazon and now they know you might want the next thing um and you can buy right right then whereas everything else there's at least one or two more steps in the middle so yeah, is amazon is an amazon viewer the most valuable i'll let you into an insight which is a personal one you know they, they've been my bet um for the sports space for for a very long time i i I took over running my division at IMG about four and a half years ago. And in, in my first, I call it an assembly, but essentially you'd probably call it a town hall. My first address to the 1500 people at, at the time was, you know, the future of our space is going to be working alongside the streaming companies. Where, where is it the best place to monetize th these audiences with the biggest retailer in the world? I mean, they, these, they sit on more data, more understanding through a through a prime subscription which you know is not an insubstantial amount of money they create retail value and an engagement for purchasing unlike anyone else and and people don't dwell on it but but the strength and power of amazon is incredible you layer on top of that the ability to to broadcast and convert that attention yeah i i, I think they they will be a a major player for for long long into the future but I'm I'm a huge Apple fan. Um I've I've been an early adopter. I I pretty much acquired the um Vision Pro almost on day 1. I happened to be out in Cupertino because I was up up the road at Stanford. Um and you know you would never bet against those guys. What what they've done to position themselves for the future of of AI I think is incredible and you know their ability to to get higher levels of engagement out of those devices, you know, I don't think I don't think you can overlook I was talking to someone on, on the way back from the, the the Euros final, and we were talking about how the industry's changed and how content consumption has changed. And then I pointed out that we both, uh, during this conversation, were holding our phones in our hands. And you just realize how much behavior has changed, how much we've come to rely on those devices. And, you know, Apple are, are the biggest and the best in that, in that space. Um, but similarly, Netflix and others. So... Yeah, I think I think they're all going to succeed when it comes to sports content. Yeah, it does feel asymmetric to me how we have, you know, all these different players bidding for the same media rights, but some of them are just media companies and they're, you know, hanging on to, I mean, obviously, you know, not to call Paramount or Comcast by any means a, you know, a, a small player in, in anything, but um you 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 put them up against you know sometimes they're bidding on different categories but you, you you put them up against you know an amazon or an apple who have these enormous businesses that don't have anything to do with broadcasting sports or broadcasting anything um and can you know to some degree um have some um cross-pollination between their you know, they're, they're consumers of devices for Apple or just for <laughs> buying things for Amazon. Whereas, you know, if you're a Fox, a Paramount, a Comcast, even a Disney, you don't quite have that, that same level of um, ability to, to kind of have your, your different customers from different verticals mix with each other and, you know, have that synergy. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if those legacy media companies 
not that they're going to disappear or anything anytime soon, but it, it really seems like an uphill climb with these new players in there. You'd think it's it's probably not not a fair fight, but but actually, you know, they also have incredible reach, and and as things stand, you know, they're still able to deliver this broad, huge, simultaneous audience, which again versus versus other means of broadcast is is still currently very challenging to match. You know, you're you're not going to get 24 million concurrent viewers using you know. Apple TV, you're not going to get 24 million concurrent users through Netflix in the UK. You're not going to get 100 plus million people using any of the platforms in the US. I know Peacock set, you know, a, a new great record for the NFL game in the past season, but it's still a quarter of what you could expect um, for a, for a main a main broadcast. So there's still there's still life in those businesses, and you know, managed in the right way. You know, it's 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 going to be very interesting to watch the the new the new Paramount business build um, into this new era, um, and and I think it's a smart play to try and you know combine technology with linear broadcast and and see just how much scope there is to to continue creating creating returns from that more traditional platform. I think it comes down to the the core topic that we that we've been discussed, and it's certainly it's certainly been a big focus for us, which is, you know, what ultimately does sport need? Uh, our our vision is is power the world's passion for sport, and that passion is is really unmatched in any other form of media. But how do you make sure you're maximizing value, that you're maximizing the return? And you know, for a long time, competition format and and structure was a was a sacred cow could not be touched that this is this is just our domain we are the sport experts and you guys help us with you know the dirty the dirty business making money where we've where the team here has repositioned the business has been how do we prove through our deep expertise our ability to develop strategy analyze the wider economy how can we demonstrate that we can add value and a key way, there's a long list of examples, but we, we sort of helped pioneer this with the launch of the IPL cricket in India, the, the short form 2020 version of the game. Back in 2007, we worked with the BCCI as they were facing local local competition. And there the, the effort was to speed up the game, to make the product much more entertaining for fans, attractive to broadcasters, understanding that, you know, A, you know, if you know cricket, one of the formats is the five-day test match, which can end in a draw. That, that's that's pretty challenging for some audiences. Um, you have to be you know, a, this, a pretty uh, engaged fan for that one. You got to, you have, and some people live and die by that format. But 2020 made a two-hour um, broadcast window possible, full of really exciting content. We we did something similar with um, the competition calendar for Euroleague basketball, which is the, the biggest basketball outside of the NBA, long-standing, big Euro European um, sports franchises and brands like Real Madrid, like Barcelona, Olympiacos, Bayern, Bayern Munich. And we partnered with them um, eight years ago now. And one of, the, one of the key criteria was we need to improve the setup. We need to, we need to really drive to premium and one of the one of the mantras was we had to make every game matter it's something that the nba doesn't have and it was a real point of differentiation so there we actually cut some of the teams we made the league smaller 
in order to make the competition much more relevant. It meant we could have a true league format where all the teams played each other home and away. And that meant you were going to get the best matchups guaranteed from the big rivalries every season. And that helped us transform the structure. We're working with the, the domestic football league in Belgium. We've worked with rugby formats. And, and it really covers you know, the, the core elements that I've said. How do you maximize media rights value? That is always going to be the biggest driver for value in sport. How do we maximize the volume, make sure the games are meaningful, make sure we've got the, the superstars really competing in, in the best forums as, as often as possible? Um, how do we make sure you still retain the sporting integrity? So making sure there's, there's fairness to the players and, and, and the teams, making sure that you know, it's practical so that stakeholders can, can really buy into it, and also make sure we're thinking not just about short-term wins, but a long-term sustainable growth model. Um, and what we've really had a lot of success with over the past few years growing our business is, is growing our influence in sport and making sure that our partners realize that each of these elements are really part of a, a holistic vision and that driving an overall value proposition has to include understanding how format of the competition is related and, and closely linked to media values, but making sure that the competition on the on the ground, on the pitch, on the court, in the field, really is produced in a way that the content can drive engagement on the screen. That that in turn can impact how brands will engage with sport. That all of that needs to drive direct to fan, direct to audience engagement, which can be achieved through digital. The strategy is is vital vitally important to all of that, and all of these capabilities and services are very closely interlinked. But, you know, often driven by the simple thing, you know, how, how long does this particular game take to, to participate in? How long can you keep the fans engaged? How much can you, you know, keep the athletes on the field for and, and making sure it all gels together? So pretty complicated stuff. That's why I've got nearly 2,000 people supporting me in, in, my, in my mission here at, at IMG and how I think we're having more and more impact to, to really drive this growth throughout our, our client base and the wider industry. All right. Really fascinating stuff. Learned a lot here. Adam Kelly, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Aaron. That's everything for today. Owen will be back for Thursday's show, so I'll be with you for the next few days. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for early access to exclusive conversations like the ones you heard today and highlights from this weekend's Huddle in the Hamptons. More on that to come. This has been Front Office Sports Today. We'll talk tomorrow.